Hello and welcome to Q&A with Pilar Palomero, the writer and director of Las Niñas Schoolgirls, the award-winning film showing at Amplify Festival as part of Amplify Festival. An uh, online film festival brought to you in collaboration with Cambridge Film Festival, Cornwall Film Festival, Brighton Cine City and Bath Film Festival as well. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Pilar Palomero to Amplify to join me for a short Q&A about schoolgirls. Pilar, welcome along. Hi, Denny. Hi. I don't Great see you. I'm sorry, I don't see you. I don't know if everything is okay. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah, I see you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Nothing like a bit of turning it off and turning it back on again. And there we are. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. So you're in Barcelona. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll chat for a little bit and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So just to mention now, if, um, if anyone watching would like to post their questions, please either type the question in the chat box or tweet at Amplify Film and we'll answer your questions, we'll get the questions at the end. So just to start off, Pilar, for people who've watched Las Niñas or for people who haven't yet seen it, either way, it would be lovely to hear in your own words how you would describe the story and explain why it was a story that you wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you uh, to Amplify and to all of you and also to the people that are uh, watching or will watch or watch the film already. Uh, it's my pleasure to be to be here in the Q&A. And well, Las Niñas is a film that uh, speaks about, well, it's a coming of age, um, moreover, about uh, a teenage girl uh, well, or a little girl coming um becoming a teenager during the year 92 in Spain. And it's a film that it's very autobiographical, um, even though I'm not Celia, the main character, but all this universe in which she's living in, uh, it has to do a lot with my own education and my own experiences when I was the same age, when I was 12 years old. And I wanted to portray how it was to grow up in this society for the woman of my generation. That's what, that was the, the main idea when I started to think about the project and to think about the film I wanted to, 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 to shoot. And the year it's set in is really important. Can you g explain why, why that year is significant? Hmm. Well, uh, the, the fact that happens that the story takes place in the year 92, it's a little bit, um, I mean, it's, it, it's, not, it's not chosen at random, but at the same time, it's a coincidence because the year 92 in Spain was very special and in the general memory of in society of people my age and older generations, they all remember about it because it was the year of the Olympic Games of Barcelona, also the year of the Expo of Sevilla. And it was a time that uh, Spain was living uh, a sense of uh, euphoria somehow, no? Like, uh, like uh, finally, uh, society felt that uh, we we um, we, we could uh, live uh, without uh, all this heavy weight of the past of the of the Spanish uh, uh, recent history, and we uh, and Spain was already like a modern country and was liberated. Uh, but uh, what I remember of the year 92, and mostly what I started to, to remember when, 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 I, when I was writing the script, is that um, the year 92 was not that year we were all thinking about uh, liberation and about modernity. Uh, what I lived and also what many people of my, of my surrounding uh, lived is that uh, a society that was very much um, uh, uh, that was very much uh, still in the past, no? with a very conservative uh, way of thinking, also with a lot of uh, traditions that were still uh, important and that uh, for the year 92 were very too conservative. 
No, I don't know if I explain it very well. No, that's great. And and so Celia, the the main character, her her sort of world, her class is shifted um, at school when there's a new girl. Can you tell us a bit about the character of Brisa? Mm -hmm. Yes, Brisa is a character that uh, somehow she she starts the click on Celia's um, on Celia's trip, no, or journey. Uh, is not she is not. I mean, she's the catalyzer, but she's not the reason why Celia starts this trip. Uh, but um, she is the person that makes her to to open a little bit her eyes to the, to to adulthood. Um, she comes from Barcelona and this is not, I mean, it, what I wanted to portray with this, it was the difference between a, a very big city, like for example, Madrid or Barcelona, that it was the two big cities in Spain at the, uh, right now and in the past, and the differences uh, with other cities in Spain, that they, they were much bigger 30 years ago. And nowadays, everything's very similar. Even in a very small village, uh, we have uh, access to everything through internet and also communication has changed. But in the year 92, we were still a little bit, um, I mean, it was 30 years ago already, no? it was a long time. And um, we didn't have access to much uh, or so easy to some kind of music or, well, not, not music to the um, CDs or maybe to the tapes and mm. also mentality in the bigger city was also more, I mean, it was more easy to, to, to be surrounded by, a, by, by more freedom uh, if the place you come from, it was bigger, no? So, um, and that's what I wanted to, to, to have with Brisa's, uh, with Brisa's character. She's the one that she tells, explains her parents are not married and everything is okay. And she's totally, uh, she comes totally from a different, uh, education that that one that she that Telly is receiving at the school and also at uh, at her house that was one thing that i found really interesting is as you say the lack the the, the technology the technical technological changes in the past 30 years or so so none of the girls obviously have mobile phones internet mm -hmm. and it's a reminder of how how much the girls sort of learn about growing up from their friendship group or from their friend, their older siblings, their friends' older siblings. Um, did any of the young cast members comment on that sort of lack of, you know, being able to just look anything up on the internet, which they have now? Have you, or have audience members, younger audience members, commented on that? lack of access to knowledge through the technology, the lack of technology. Mm -hmm. have, yeah. you, have you noticed that? Yeah. Yeah, if I notice on, on, on the girls, on the actresses, you mean? Yes, yeah. Did they comment on that at all? Yes, yes, because we didn't have re rehearsals. Uh, actually, they didn't read the script. And um, what we did instead of having like a traditional rehearsal, it was more um, about gathering together and we were having some lessons. I mean, it was, they were not really lessons, but how was the year 92 and how, how did we dress up or how did we put our makeup on? And, and how the life was back in the 92. And of course, uh, I mean, the, the fact that we live without uh, cell phones, they already knew because of their parents. And um, uh, they didn't know also how to make, uh, how to make work um, a radio cas uh, cassette, you know, <laughs> things like this. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's something they, they, they know, but I don't think they can really imagine how is it like to live without internet connection all day long. But I have to say that Andrea Fandos, the girl that plays Celia, uh, she didn't have cell phone yet because she was too young. She was only 11 when, when she was shooting the film. And in Spain, I mean, it's not, I mean, this is like something more or less. Um, teenagers get their first cell phone around 13, 12, 13. Yeah, so Celia didn't have any, no, no, okay. 
Instagram, no Twitter, nothing. Okay. I was going to ask actually about the casting because uh, Andrea Fandos is such a, her presence on screen, she's mesmerizing because she manages to, it's quite a still performance at times, but you can tell that there is so much internal questioning going on. She manages to communicate so much with her eyes. Um, can you talk us about talk us through the casting process for for her and for the other the other girls in the cast? Yes. Well, about Celia, her eyes and and the way she looks to things. What was really made me to fall in love with her and to feel I found uh, the right Celia for the film. And I met her because she was um, she was acting in a short film of Ignacio La Sierra that he is a director from Zaragoza. And I saw her in the short film and I really liked her, but she was too young when I started the casting because we started casting uh, seven months before shooting. So she was still, she was, I think she was 10. And Celia's character at the beginning in the first drafts, uh, drafts of the script was um, 13, 14. Um, so the first time I saw, I cast uh, Andrea, uh, I liked her very much, but she was too young to play Celia. And um, three months later, we called her again and think, mm, I don't know, or whatever. <laughs> she, she, she pegó el estirón, as we say in Spanish, like she, she grew up very, very fast. Right. She shot up. Yes, and um, and she was still not looking like a 13-year-old girl. So th this is the moment that I decided to make Celia younger when you're younger and to adapt the script. Because right. I, really, I really had the feeling that she was Celia, that the way she was moving, the way her, 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 her innocence and the tenderness, um, I really felt it was her. And then for the other girls, we made this very long casting during seven month proce uh, process. And it was, it was uh, difficult, but funny. It was a very intense uh, job that I did with uh, Gisela Krem, the casting director. And what we looked, uh, it was to, uh, we, we were looking for girls that were, were, that we felt they were able to be very authentic in front of the camera. And, to, and that some, I mean, and that they can be, that they were a little bit similar to the characters in the script. Or also we, we, we adapt the script to, to the way they, 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 they were. And I don't know, for example, with Brisa, uh, which is played by Zoe Arnau, that she is from Barcelona. I, it happened also a little bit like with Andrea, that I, I, I love her and I fall in love with her because I, I, I also, when I saw her, I, I, I thought I found, I found her, no? because she, she had mystery, she's like very elegant. And um, I don't know. She's sophisticated, and it was it was it was my my first experience in a casting, and I have yeah. I have to say it was one of the, the parts that I enjoyed enjoyed the most, you know, the process. Oh wow! And I love the fact that you adapted the script to the to the characters, and it feels so. There were scenes that were quite improvised. Is that right? There were elements that the actresses brought into the scenes. Yes, I mean, if, um, they didn't read the script, only the adults uh, playing roles, like for example, uh, the nan or Natalia de Molina, they, they, they did have the script and they read it and I talked uh, with them about it, but the girls didn't read it um, because I wanted them to, to be very free and to live the moment. Uh, but the funny thing is that the the the, um, the film uh, now uh, the film uh, finished no uh, it's very similar to the script so I think right. we made we made a journey uh, of uh, for, forgetting the script during the shooting but to come back there uh, there during the editing because also depending on the scene it was it was some scenes when whenever they are playing or they are just chatting, that they are really improvising and they are really themselves. With some guys, like, you cannot say this expression because during the year in attitude, you wouldn't say this. Um, mm -hmm. But then also there are other scenes that they need to, to be very specific about the sentence they say. 
you know? So in these moments, they didn't read the script, we were improvising, but we were guiding them very, very much, you know, with uh, Ruben Martinez, the coach. And um, sometimes I was uh, giving them the lines during, while, while we were shooting, while we were, we were recording. Uh, but also, um, I mean, they had the talent to, to, to be able to repeat it with the same freshness, freshness you know? Right. So it was a mix. It was a mix. We were always trying to do whatever was the best, you no? Know? And if it was improvisation, it was improvisation. If it was better uh, to, to, to read the line to them, uh, we would do it. But uh, what I have to say is that all of them, even though it was their first, first film, uh, they are very talented, uh, what I feel, but also, I mean, they are, they are, they are great actresses because they, they, they were, I mean, they, they really were able to, to modulate their emotions and to, to well, to, to interpret it. Mm. We're getting some comments from, from people watching who are agreeing at just how brilliant the casting is. So thank you for that. Cause yeah, I, you watch, you feel like you know the characters and that friendship group instantly, they, they just feel so fully formed as characters. Um, one of my favorite scenes is when Brisa plays uh, the song, I think it's Ninos del Brasil to the group of girls. And, and as the, we are watching the girls listening to a song for the first time, I mean, Brisa and Celia have already heard it, but the other girls haven't. And I just, I thought it was really powerful for, for many reasons, but can you talk to us about how the role that music plays in the film? Hmm. Yeah, music was very important and we made a very specific uh, soundtrack because, um, well, the story is set in Zaragoza. Zaragoza is my hometown. And Zaragoza at the beginning of the 90s it had like a boom, a music boom, no? With the, we had a very, very famous music group that was also very well known in the whole world. I don't know if you remember them, that they were called Eros del Silencio. And yeah. uh, it was like the first Spanish group that was really making into, you know, like they were getting very, very, very well known abroad. And, um, and not only them, also Niños del Brasil, as you said, and um, Las Novias, Timo Bayo. It was all music that was playing at that moment. And it was the music we were listening. And for example, in my case, um, my Brisa in this sense was my own brother and my own sister because they were, they are older than me and they would come to, to our place with uh, these tapes of music. And, and it's the music that we were listening with our uniform, no? And yeah. for me, it was very funny because sometimes we were walking through some areas in Zaragoza. And I remember um, gathering or uh, hanging around with these heavy metal guys, no? And uh, with punkies. It was like many, many different uh, hero band, uh, how do you call it? Um, Urban tribes, and yeah. and it was it was this 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 strange mix of the of of uh, something very uh, very conservative, you no? Know, these little girls in the uniform with the Catholic education, and then also this wish and this this music that uh, was uh, was asking and was uh, dreaming about uh, freedom and about uh, living life, you no. Know? Yeah, and it's also the, well, there's, the, as you say, the freedom. And I loved seeing the mixtapes and sort of how Lisa is able to educate Celia through music and to show her this other musical world, but also how the film begins, how music, the part it plays at school, you know, the girls have their voices taken away and, and, well, I don't know about other people watching it, but I had to check the sound was on when the film started because the girls are mumming. Um, and, and so, you know, Celia really finds her voice in, in the film, which is lovely. And I love how music helps to tell that story. Um, one question about, you've mentioned it's part autobiographical and as someone who grew up around that time, but in England, I would say there are universal 
parts. I love the detail, the painting your nails with Tipex, <laughs> and, uh, playing like your nunca nunca. I've never ever. I mean, these are brilliant, you know, lots of memories there. But you've mentioned your brother and sister. Have you, uh, with regards to the story, what are the specific parts are from your experience? Yeah, all this universe of the film, of this city during the year 92 is exactly, I mean, it's yeah, exactly taken from my memories. Actually, this scene you are mentioning, the first scene in which mm -hmm. the girls are singing without or real singing, not without voices, it's a true story, not because this is what was happening at my school. And as I can see now, after releasing the film, um, it happened to many other people that, uh, um, I don't know why, <laughs> uh, we were not allowed to sing, not to, to just to, to look like perfect girls, no? instead of just obviously in kids or, uh, singing in, in, in this school uh, coro, uh, choir. Choir, yeah. Uh, so I had a lot of memories of my childhood and 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 also the um, uh, the first idea, the first moment that I realized it was a story, a story behind it. It was the moment that I found at my at my parents' place this religion notebook with an essay that it's the essay that appears during the religious class about uh, the sexuality in the service of God. You no, know? and when I read it. Uh, when I was already 35 or something like this, I um, I was uh, shocked, you know, that uh, this was happening in '92. That's also why it's happening. I mean, the film is set there, and and all this is taken from my memories. You know, the the games we were playing, also the prejudice that we have. I remember that in my, I mean, this uh, this feeling about uh, uh, judging girls because they didn't come from a normal, no, whatever, I mean, like a classic family. Uh, also, it was almost impossible to talk about sexuality. And, and then there is one very important um, element in the film that for me, to me, uh, describes perfectly how was the society back then. And, is, and I don't know if, if people outside, outside Spain uh, really can see it because it's very specific of our culture and of our history. But is this uh, campaign of uh, of the condoms of, uh, that uh, Pontelo Poncelo that it's called uh, and it's uh, in the front of the school. And this this uh, this is some that's also another true story. No, that it was a campaign, a, a publicity campaign from the um, Ministry of Health. Um, to well to inform and to to give tools to to the people uh, uh, to, to to be um, to be safe uh, against uh, AIDS and sexual uh, illnesses uh, and it, it was forbidden. This campaign was forbidden two years later uh, right. because yeah because they they consider some part of the society considered that it was it was instead of of being an informative campaign it was a, a campaign that was um that was um animando no that was cheering no uh, youngsters to have sex so, i see encouraging yeah. people to yeah go okay right so I think this is the, the biggest contradiction in this at, the, at this time in this society, and I think this very specific ad of Ponte lo Poncelo, you see it, or I don't know how is it translated in English. It is how society in the ninety two was, and also is part of my memories and of this autobiographical part of the film. I see, I see. Okay, now that that's that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm just looking at some of the questions and uh, one question is about um, actors and, and the role of men in the film. Was it a conscious decision not to show really any men at all, give or take the odd doctor here or there? Hmm. No, it was not a conscious decision, uh, but I'm sure it happened to be like this for, for a reason. And I think the biggest reason, because it's not the first time I, 
I answer to this question. And I think the, the, the biggest reason is because when I was this age, when I was 10, uh, 11, 12, um, my work is biographical, autobiographical part of the film. Uh, my work was very feminine. At the school, we didn't have any men teacher. It was all nuns or all female mm -hmm. teachers. And uh, we were all girls. Uh, boys started to be in my school like three years after, uh, like three years behind me. Uh, so for me, beyond my, my brother and my father, uh, all my world was totally feminine. And um, and that, I think this is the big, the, I mean, the, uh, the, the biggest reason for it. Uh, but for example, I love the main characters that appear in the film. Uh, the doctor, one of the doctors is my brother, I have to say. And oh. the other one, the boy in the disco. Uh, oh, he's so uh, sweet. It's very tender, and also I, I love him. He he was uh, we didn't find the, the, the perfect guy to play this role because he had to be like cute and not, not to feel it like uh, you know something not nice. And one day um, we were in the office in pre-production, and the the son of the makeup uh, chief came, and it was him. I saw him, and I was like, oh, this is the guy. It has to be Edu. So I. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Um, also, another question about the identity of Celia's father. Um, people in the audience have had lots of debate about what was, who was he, what, what, you know, what sort of a person was he. Can you shed any light of what you think Celia's father, what sort of a character he was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I wanted with this is to have is that the audience have the same information that Helia has during the whole film, no? So that's right. also why I didn't want it to make it more clear, or, I mean, it's not also that I wanted to make confusion about it, not, not at all, but um, what I wanted is to not to have more information than the one that Helia has. And, um, and when she goes to, to see uh, the village of her mother, and she can see the education and the, well, the lack of love of, in her life uh, coming from her family is the moment she, is, she starts to understand her mother. And uh, in this moment, in very small places, uh, to be a single mother was still being like um, something to hide and something to be ashamed of. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is what I wanted to portray in the film, that how still in the year 92, to be a single mother, I mean, you could be punished by society because of being a single mother. And that's what Thelia sees. She, she doesn't have the real answer because the mom cannot, um, cannot even uh, say it loud to her when she tries to talk to her. But she, she has the sense that her mother did something that was not right for society, no? And uh, this is what I want the audience to feel. Mm. There's a real tenderness between their relationship. I think that was beautifully brought to life, was Celia's, yeah, even, even though they may not communicate with words, mm. such a gentleness between them, which was really, really lovely to, to see that. Um, it was real also in real life, Natalia and Andrea. Uh, it was, I mean, they 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 had a, an amazing relationship. It was very beautiful wow. to see them work. Well, there's um, another question about scene near the end uh, between uh, her mother and grand grandmother, uh, mm -hmm. described as as very powerful and understated. Had you always imagined a scene like that, or did it emerge during the the writing or filmmaking process, or had had you got that idea from the beginning to have that scene? Well, I really don't know when I had the idea, but I'm I mean, in the film, uh, the parts that are not autobiographical, um, they are also not. I mean, they are not invented. I didn't make them up. I, I made a lot of research, and I talk with a lot of people of my. I mean, mostly with friends and friends that were in similar experiences, and also with some uh, um, groups of, of of single mothers. 
uh, or that they were, they were single mothers during the 90s. And this, and also a radio program that I was listening in the national radio that was about uh, this um, kind of a hospitality house for uh, single mothers during that was closed in the year 87. I mean, because Celia was supposed to be born in the year 1980, like myself. Right. Uh, right. So these kind of, of, of hospitality houses existed in Spain until the year 87. And uh, I started to make a research and I realized that, uh, well, it's not that I, re I realized, but I talked with them and also I, I understood uh, that uh, that the weight of the of this of, of this woman that they had to run run away from their houses because of these preju uh, prejudices, but that that the truth is that they were fighters and they were heroines because uh, they were totally alone. Uh, mm -hmm. It was for me very shocking and also very inspiring, no? And I wanted to Celia to make this journey, no? To see her mother as a person that is all the time, uh, you know, like working, that she's not taking care of her a lot, but then she discovers that she's a fighter and that she's a, that she she she's somebody to be proud of. Mm. And, um, and, and I think uh, in these cases where single mothers have, because I mean, of course, not all single mothers, no? There is so many situations at that time, nowadays, and during history, no? But uh, when families were not accepting this situation, um, it was very, I mean, you can imagine, no? How hard it was for the for women to, to mm -hmm. feel like, like they, they, like the, the education they received made them believe to themselves that they didn't behave well. You know. Yeah. What? Yeah. And I think the fact that it's such recent history, it's it's stories that need to be being told because it's actually quite shocking that it's still so recent that, you know, essentially they had to. Some women will have had to choose between raising a child on her own and, or, you know, and the reaction of the family, um, mm -hmm. you know, necessary stories to, to tell. I, I just wanted to ask about the reaction that you've had from women who have seen the film, who may have seen their own story on screen, either, either Celia or Celia's mother. What sort of feedback have you had from, from women who've watched the film? In general, the feedback has been amazing, and um, I was very even overwhelmed because I received a lot of texts uh, through um, Instagram and Twitter, and also we were doing some Q and A's uh, in, back in September, where when the film was uh, was premiering in Spain, and. I think the film um, is connecting with many people of my my generation. Um, towards all these nostalgic elements you were mentioning. And, uh, and also uh, because I think we live in a very specific situation, no? Like uh, it was many, many of us studying in these Catholic schools that they were not private. It was, it was uh, concertado schools, no? That is half public and half, uh, half uh, funded. And, yeah. And I think people can recognize themselves very, very, very easily, or that's what um, what they are telling me through their messages. Um, and also, what what is more shocking for me is that uh, also older generations, but also younger generations, uh, feel very close to Celia and very close to what Celia is living. You no, know? and about how this um, how these contradictions in society while we were growing up about. Uh, well, not talking about our sexuality and and uh, well about growing up uh, and becoming a teenager in 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 these moments. Mm. Um, we'll we'll round off by just asking uh, finally. So, what what are you working on now? What projects are you working on? Can we look forward to seeing mm. in the future? Well, we are working in our next project. Uh, it's uh, called La, uh, called La, La Maternal and uh, we are on the process of writing the script 
And well, we, we already started also with the funding. And it's about, uh, I also come back to, to, to teenagers, but it's a very different film. And it's about uh, pregnancy and motherhood uh, um, for teenagers, but uh, the film it's, uh, it's bigger, not only speaks about uh, uh, motherhood uh, during uh, teenage years. And well, right now I'm, I'm in the process of investigating and talking with a lot of women, uh, women that were mothers when they were teenagers. And we are very excited. And hopefully we will shoot, uh, we don't know if this summer, hopefully we we'll have our fingers crossed. And would that be set in the 1990s or set in present day? In the present, in the present. Okay. okay. Well, Pilar Palomero, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to chat to us about Las Niñas. Uh, it's such a lovely film and just such memorable characters and their stories. So thank you very much. Um, and so just to thank Institute Ramon Rule and um, thank you to um, you for watching and the team at Amplify as well. So yes, Pilar, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you to the festival. Ciao, ciao.